I'm Michael Turner. I'm a cosmologist at the University of Chicago. Uh -huh. And have you ever seen a UFO? Um, I don't think I have, not to my knowledge. <laughs> and have you ever been abducted by an alien? Uh, if so, they erased all the memories. Uh -huh. So it could be that you were abducted. Well, you know, I'm a scientist, so you, scientists don't like to ever say never, right? You know, so Because we always come up with these really weird scenarios where well, I could have been abducted, and then, you know, if they're that advanced, they could erase the memories, and, yes. and uh, but, uh, yeah, no, n no memories of it. How about, are you an alien? Um, some people would call me an alien. <laughs> All right, but uh, you but don't... I do have a birth certificate, and... So you uh, don't self-identify as an alien? I don't self-identify as an alien. <laughs> now, how about this big picture? I, I talked to Sean Carroll earlier, and he's writing a book called The Big Picture, how important is the big picture? Why is it important? Why should the man in the street care and most people don't care? Is that, is that right? Or? Well, I think most people do care. Um, people want to know, how did we get here? Uh, where are we going? Are we alone? I think we all want to know our place, uh, have a sense of our place uh, in the universe. And so I think, you know, I mean, if you look at this historically, every society has had a story about how how we got here and where we're going and we're no different uh, but ours is scientific and uh, the virtue of a scientific story is it while it's never complete you can organize it into I like to organize things into three buckets what we know absolutely for sure not going away uh, I call this knocking at the door stuff that we're trying to establish and then uh, wild ass speculation and so, in science, we start with ideas, and some of them are crazy and really aren't true. Some of them are crazy enough to be true, and then we put them in this bucket, knocking at the door, and then some subset then becomes what we really know about the universe. And so, the scientific creation story is a little bit different because it's never complete, um, but as it evolves, the stuff we know for sure, if we're doing our job right, that doesn't change. How about Boltzmann brain? Some people have said there's a problem with Boltzmann brains because we have an eternal eternity ahead of us and we have vacuum fluctuations. Surely most observers would then be Boltzmann brains. But if there were, wouldn't that make them aliens as well? That would make them aliens, wouldn't they? Does they would they fall into the category of aliens? Yeah, so this third bucket out here for <laughs> wild speculation, which is very, very important, I mean, because... <laughs> How do the other buckets get fed? You mm. start out with a, an idea that's too silly and too crazy to be true, and most of them are too silly and too crazy to be true, and some of them do pan out. Mm. And so there is this issue of creating a universe, and once you start thinking about creating a universe, you think about the price of creating a universe. Mm -hmm. And uh, my, my really lowbrow understanding of the Boltzmann brain is that, you know, if you're in the business of creating universes... Why create the universe? You know, just create the brain that thinks it sees the universe. So simulate a universe. Yeah, and uh, you know, and then Max Tegmark has this book, you know, that, that, that which I think is sort of trivial, but um, it is interesting. Every person in science will tell you that the language of math, language of science, is mathematics, mm -hmm. and no one has really answered that. You know, nobody has a good answer, and so Max's answer, uh, and sometimes the the stupid trivial answer is right is. Well, the reason that it appears that the, the language of science is mathematics is because we are, we are a computer simulation. Mm -hmm. and, uh, a lot of people believe, seem to believe, I was surprised George Smoot, I heard a lecture that he gave my PhD advisor, he said, oh yes, he was, he was convinced that we were a part of a simulation. Now, simulations, however, come in different uh, price ranges. You can do, or you can do two different things. One is you can, like in computers, you can either plant, like life form, you can plant a seed and have it grow, in which case, you know, you don't need to invest much money in it. Or you can build like a corn plant or build like a... a so there are two ways to do simulations. One is to plant a seed and let it grow, which is pretty easy. Or it co doesn't cost as much, but a lot of initial research into how to make that seed. And the other is to construct it. And so I'm thinking uh, maybe there's this... Maybe all simulations can be divided into these categories. Or what do you think? Do you think we're living in a simulation now? Um, I'm not even sure what that means. I okay. mean... It, what could it mean? At, at a trivial level, we are, uh, in the sense that if you 
uh, buy into the fact that the universe has laws of physics yes. and that uh, everything has to obey these laws, well, that's what a simulation is. is a simulation is a set of rules and then you run it. Mm -hmm. And so at some trivial level, we are a simulation uh, mm -hmm. because there's, there's rules that the physical world have to follow. We call them the laws of physics. And so therefore we evolve and... Uh, but the simulation there was somebody who, or something that did the simulate thing. Well, we're, I don't know if you've... Um, I was saying in a trivial sense we're a simulation, but you're saying, okay, well if that's really true, then you don't really need to waste the whole physical world on it. You just, you know, represent it on a computer. So we, you know, uh, uh, Charlie Lineweaver doesn't need to be... Uh, you know, 80 kilograms of, of biology, we can represent them on a mm -hmm. computer with, mm -hmm. with um, so, you know, and science is interesting because um, different questions attract the interest of different people, uh, so that question doesn't really attract my interest, <laughs> okay. as you as okay. told. All and, right. But it, it's also different questions are ripe at different times, and uh, so that question may not be ripe right now. Are we alone? Um, are we alone? No. And why do you think that? Um, I, you know, it's rolling the dice. We get 10 to the 11, uh, 10 to the 11 stars, so that means 10 to the 11 planets in our galaxy, uh, 10 to the 11 galaxies. Uh, and I didn't tell you what, who our mates are. Our mates could be very boring, single-celled things, mm -hmm. but I don't think we're alone. So I don't think. So the we is we other life forms, or we yeah, the life of Earth. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And why is this an important question? Oh, my goodness. Don't you want to know? I do, but uh, it seems to not... My curiosity doesn't seem to be ubiquitous. Oh, I... Th I well, actually, I've not, not done any polling on this, but I bet... I bet if you asked 100 people, uh, are you interested in whether or not we're alone? I mean, you have to... Not everyone understands the question. You'd have to flesh it out a little bit. That I, I would imagine, and I don't know if you've done this, but I, w I somehow would imagine that 90% of the people or more would say, yeah, I'm interested in that. It's hard to compete with the gender of Kim Kardashian's children. Oh. You know, the... the uh, I Human beings are really interesting, and it's easy to underestimate the intelligence of human beings, because we all are interested in stupid things. Uh, but that doesn't mean we're inter not interested in really interesting things. And, uh, yeah, it, it's very, uh, I think people are interested in this question, uh, even if they're interested in stupid things. I think this is a universal... I mean, maybe you have to quiet them, quiet their brain down a little bit, and take away their uh, <laughs> smartphone for a few minutes. And uh, I think people are interested.